Uh, I call Gareth Hughes. Uh, kia ora, Mr Speaker. Nā mihi nui kia koutou. Kia ora. Mr Speaker, in the series of debates around this legislation, there's been a lot of talk about gas, about oil companies, about economic development. What I haven't heard is about the environment, about the actual place we're talking about, which is the exclusive economic zone. It's been entirely absent. Mr Speaker, we're incredibly lucky in New Zealand. People don't often think about us in New Zealand as a superpower. Obviously, we're a pretty small, low-populated country, but when it comes to the marine environment, we are a superpower. We've got the fourth largest EEZ in the world, an incredible environment. You've got maybe a 1,000 undersea mountains, incredible endemism, species which live here, yet don't live anywhere else on the planet, uh, huge resources, huge fish stocks, some incredible uh, flora and fauna down there, something which scientists advise us we know so little about. In fact, less than 0.41% of it is actually protected in marine reserves. So well, sure, while we're talking about a bill which is granting transitional drilling powers to one particular oil company, let's not forget what we're talking about, which is this large, rich, diverse, thriving marine environment which we still know so little about. Somewhere where more people have been to the surface of the moon than the bottom of the deep ocean, the world's second deepest submarine trench, uh, a place, Mr Speaker, none of us will get to most likely in our lives, but a place deserving of our protection. Now, when you listen to the last speaker, you'd think he was uh, Al Gore or Sir Francis of Assisi, or he'd just driven here in his electric hybrid from some adventures on the Rainbow Warrior, as if he was some sort of environmental champion. Let's not forget, though, Mr Speaker, what the government did was basically build on the work of the previous government to finally getting around to a Resource Management Act for the sea, something the Green Party had been calling for since we uh, were first elected to Parliament under our own steam in 1999, and what we got was far short of what the country actually needed or what is happening in world leading in other countries around the world, which is a comprehensive oceans policy. What we got was a resource management for the sea tilted in favour of extractive industries. Now it's been interesting to follow this process over many years in this House and in the courts, Mr Speaker, uh, and here we are with another iteration. We saw the original legislation passed, I believe, in 2012. It had to be amended to fix up some problems. I followed the High Court case when uh, Anadarko was taken to court, submitted to the Environmental Protection Authority for both the TTR and Chatham Rock Phosphate pr proposals, applications which were thrown out. And here we now see yet another amendment of this legislation. And what we're not talking about is improving the legislation. We're not talking about fixing it, some of those glaring gaps, or how we move forward to take advantage, to protect our fourth largest marine environment in the world. What this legislation does is patch up a loophole, a loophole which could have been identified by officials or government ministers originally, but where the blame fairly should lay at Shell Tottle's door. A company involved in the process around their passing of the original legislation, a company which has operated in New Zealand for decades worth tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, a company who knew its permit was expiring, they ultimately had decades of notice, but who didn't get their application in on time. Now, for someone who uh, often hears personal responsibility, why aren't we applying it in this case? We urge personal responsibility from beneficiaries, but when it comes to big corporates, why didn't we ask them why they didn't get their paperwork, their application on time? Why wasn't the executive asking them why they were lobbying them to pass a law of parliament, a statute, before they even got their application in? Mr Speaker, it does look a bit cart before the horse when you have a company who hasn't applied for an application but instead ran to Cabinet and Cabinet on the 8th of December in fact decided to pass this legislation before they even got their application and when they did ultimately have years and decades of notice. So that's why the Green Party opposed the first reading of this legislation. It really did look like one law for oil, a law for a single corporate. Now, Many members are concerned around crony capitalism or support for only a few corporates with relations with whoever's in government. And uh, this is something we were concerned about.
because ultimately there's a whole host of legislative solutions this house should be taking to grow our economy, to build a more prosperous uh, economy, to grow those jobs and to protect our environment. It's not this choice between one or the other. In fact, protecting our environment is our key to economic prosperity. But we're not debating those. We're debating passing a law to help a company who didn't get its application in on time despite all the notice. However, we were uh, pleased to note the constructive positive atmosphere in the Select Committee. We'd like to acknowledge once again uh, the Chair, Mr Simpson, the members and the five submitters. We have made improvements and that's why we are subsequently changing our vote to support this law. Ultimately what this law does is uh, a single thing, allowing transitional provisions in the case of an appeal for a marine consent applicant whose permit expires. We will not see this in effect for decades given the other applications with marine permits will not be applying for marine consents for some decades. So we're talking about transitional provisions, something we already see analogous in the Resource Management Act, something non-controversial, but we have managed to clarify it, adding new clause section 1625, which allows the nine month or 140 statutory day consistency with the existing primary legislation uh, to incentivise companies to actually get their applications in on time. If this amendment had not been made, there would have been an incentive for a marine applicant or the oil company in this example to put their application in the day before their permit expires because they know they're protected by statute that uh, for the course of the process through the EPA and any future appeals, they would be protected and their activity could continue. Secondly, in the same section, we saw clarification around what an application meant. The way it was drafted, it was dubious and could have been challenged in a court. By clarifying that it must be a complete application, which gives the EPA the powers to request additional information, such as a uh, oil spill impact assessment in the case of an oil industry company applicant, there is certainty it must be a complete applicant, uh, a complete application, and it's important because I'm aware of uh, a few applications, despite the small number to the EPA, where considerable information has been presented. So Mr Speaker, we've signalled our concerns. We identified we'd be lodging a protest vote in the first reading. We're uh, happy and like to acknowledge the members on the committee to improve it. That's why we'll be changing our vote. But Mr Speaker, let's get around to having the real conversation, which is how do we look after the fourth largest part of marine space in the world owned by a company? Mr Speaker, we had concerns with the original EEZ legislation that it was too focused on extractive industries. At the time I called it an EZ drilling bill because of how much weaker it was than the RMA, how the precautionary principle wasn't carried over despite the international importance of this principle. It was only a precautionary principle. So we've got concerns that we're not protecting our taonga, our heritage, our beautiful natural environment. So what's next? What we need to have a conversation at is how do we see greater marine protection across the water out from 12 nautical miles in the EZ? It's a scandal, Mr Speaker, that in 2015 we still cannot create marine reserves in the EEZ, and that's why we have uh, less than half of 1% of our waters protected in marine reserves in total. What we need to be doing is taking uh, a smart approach what we should be undertaking is a spatial planning approach to our marine environment and having those conversations. Where are the special protected areas? Where are the areas we need to find out more information? Where are the go areas for extractive industries? Where are the no-go areas? Because what we have seen under the current legislation is two companies, TTR and CRP, investing tens of millions of dollars and having their applicants thrown out from the EPA. Now I personally submitted against them because of the huge environmental consequences they had. But it's unfair I believe for these applicants when the lack of certainty. That's why I'm calling for a seabed moratorium. We should actually undertake some of the fundamental scientific questions, undertake the spatial planning so we actually know what's down there in the go and no go areas. So these companies when they do apply, and look, who knows if they'll have a case in the future or in a different location, but when they're literally throwing tens of millions of dollars away because of a flawed process, I think it's in everyone's interest to work together to undertake this policy. 
Just lastly, instead of looking at individual species under the quota management system or individual areas in isolation, we should in fact be taking an ecosystem approach. So Mr Speaker, we're calling for a spatial planning, ecosystem approach, greater protection, and these are what's going to protect our shared prosperity. Sorry, the uh, member's time has expired. I call Ron Mark.